Let's uh, jump into my message and uh, talk about Corinth. Remember, uh, just getting, putting, getting our orientation back here, Corinth was a thriving commercial center in the first century Rome. In first century Rome, the Romans conquered it in 146 BC. Julius Caesar restored it, made it a Roman city in 45 BC. And the Roman gods were venerated in first century Corinth. They worshiped the Roman guards. Now, I'm going to parenthetically insert this. We think, well, Jeff, why are we always talking about this history stuff? You know, let's just, let's just get in the Word. Let's just stay in the, in the Bible and everything. And my point in all of this is connecting the Bible to the real world. This is not a fairy tale book. These places, these people, we can go outside the Scriptures and find evidence for so much of what the Bible contains. And so for me, to understand in our time, in 2022, what the Bible is saying to us, we have to understand it in the context where it was written. What did Paul intend to communicate to the Corinthians in first century Rome, and the first century Roman Empire, and how does that translate to us in the United States of America in Canyon City in 2022? So these connections are important. It's not, we're not just in, in world history class, you know, when we look at all this stuff. The, but we want to understand that this book, and I really appreciate who put, this, who put this up here for me. This is awesome. This book is not a fairy tale. You know, it is connected to the human story. And, and, and I would go so far as to say the human story does not make sense without this. You know? So that's why I spend so much time on this and help, helping us to understand um, what Paul, Peter, James, John, all the authors of the scriptures, their times, their lives, and what it meant in that first century context so that we know how it fits us today. And we, we avoid the thing, well, I think this means to me that, no, I, I don't care what it means to you. What does it say? What does it mean? And, and I don't mean that in, a, in, a, in an unkind way, but you follow me? It's not subject to personal interpretation. The Bible says that itself. It's, the Word of God is not subject to any private interpretation. You know, but it's inspired and passed down. And we'll, and we'll talk about that sometime, that some of the, 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 the amazing stories of the men and women who gave their lives to ensure we have the Bible today in our time. So going back to Corinth... Worshipping the pagan gods, the Roman gods. Their chief god was Neptune, you remember? They believed he was the source of their prosperity because they were a sea, they were a sea community. They lived, their, their, their community was right on the um, Mediterranean Sea there, and they were a huge commerce center. Um, so they worshipped him regularly. They had, they had biennial games in his honor. They worshipped other gods as well. Apollo was another god they worshipped, and they attributed poetry and music and prophetic oracles to him. If you wanted to know something about your life, you went to one of Apollo's oracles, and she would prophesy over you. She would tell you what's gonna, what the gods had in store for you. The Corinthians worshipped the god Demeter, who was the goddess of, the, of agriculture. If they had a good year for crops, that was a sign of her favor. If they had a bad year, they had clearly offended the goddess and sacrifices had to be made. And then Venus, or Aphrodite, as you know her in, Greek, in the Greek mythologies, she was worshipped in the temples as well. She had her own temple dedicated to her. Remember that the, the Corinthians were a very sensual people. And while this was characteristic of the pagan world in the first century at large, the Corinthians excelled at being a sexualized culture, so much so that they even earned the disgust of the rest of the pagan world around them. And so when the pagans are looking at you and saying, you guys are nasty, you know you're nasty. You know? When the, the, other, the other pagans were, who were involved in the same sorts of things, but they point to you and say, they're the worst. You know, that's, that's Corinth, and that's where Paul would spend, he came to Corinth in late 52, early 53 A.D., and started sharing Jesus with people who lived there. And after being in Corinth for a year and a half, Paul left behind a young new church, redeemed Gentiles and Jews, who had come into the kingdom of God through his ministry, and now were proclaiming the name of Jesus. But they came with some baggage, especially the Gentile faction. 
there were several issues that Paul addresses in his first letter to this church. One of them has to do with their understanding of the person and role of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we looked at the, at the abuses of communion, if you remember, and, and the stuff that, was, that they were doing in the communion celebration that was just like, wait a minute, Paul said, hey, time out. No, this is not right. Well, now he's going to take on the top, the, their misunderstanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how spiritual gifts move in the church. Yep. So this is such an important issue to Paul that they're out of the 437 verses that make up 1 Corinthians, 84 of them are devoted to the topical of spirit, topic of spiritual gifts. That's almost 20% of his letter is devoted exclusively to correcting their, their misunderstandings on spiritual gifts, how they moved in the church, and how the church was to function in, in those gifts. That's pretty significant to me. So there are several things Paul talks about concerning spiritual gifts. First, he takes on the idea that different spirits are sources of different gifts. See, the Corinthians believed that if I had the gift of whatever, some, some spirit, like their gods used to do, some spirit was influencing me to have a gift. And this other person has a different gift. And it's a different spirit that's influencing them. That's how they understood the Godhead. Well, that's messed up, right? Paul reminds them of their polytheistic background. He says, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. In other words, I want you to be informed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or another, you were led away and influenced and led astray to mute idols. He goes on to say there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. So the Holy Spirit is the source of all of the gifts. Right? There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. All this diversity you're, you're seeing in your church that you're attributing to a bunch of different Spirits? No, no, it's the same God who's be, who is the source of all of this. And before we take a look at the gifts themselves, I want to call your attention to how Paul is approaching this topic. If you look carefully, you'll see that he brings the Holy Trinity into the discussion. He asserts that there's one Spirit, one Lord, and one God in that passage of Scripture who is the source of all the gifts. Now, this is, this is extremely relevant because we, as we look at these, we find in the Bible that there are actually three categories of gifts, and I'm not sure that that's the complete list. So, okay, so I'm not, I'm not going to be narrow about that. There, Paul is using, giving examples and talking about things. There may, there may be beyond what's in the Scriptures other things that we would consider to be gifts. You know? But basically, we see in the Scriptures that there are three categories of gifts. Because in that passage of Scripture, the words used to define each category of gift is different, excuse me, in the Greek, in the Greek text. Okay, so I'm going to geek out on you a little bit and get into the Greek. He says in verse 4 that there are different gifts but the same spirit. And the word for gifts in that verse is charismata. We get the word charismatic from that. These are, in verse 7, it goes on to say, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. These special gifts. These charismatic gifts. And they're given for the common good. The Corinthians had forgot that. They thought they were given to, to, to have a, a reason to boast of your status and position in Christ. Because remember, the church is divided over all kinds of things. That was one of them. Was my gift's bigger than yours because I do this. You know? Then he continues, there are different kinds, okay, so we have the charismata, the, the gifts of the Spirit. Then he goes, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And the word for service here is the word diakonia. And it comes from the same root word as the word deacon comes from. And it means to serve. In the first century, if you use the word diakonos, to somebody, they would not think a leader in the church. They would think a table waiter because that's what a deacon was. In the first century, they waited tables in restaurants. 
And that, that, that concept came into the church as a form of service, and later it became an office with authority and power. But it can, and, and, and it should never lose its service nature. It's about serving. The set of, these are a set of gifts that are given to people who are called by, to, by the Lord to perform specific services in the body of Christ. And they include elders and deacons and possibly could include the, the fivefold gifts that we see in Ephesians 4 where he talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are service gifts that are given to people to, to minister to the body of Christ. So we've got the manifestations of the Spirit on this here. We've got these service gifts here. And then, when, when we, we continue looking at it, while, while 1 Corinthians associates the charismatic gifts with the Holy Spirit, the service gifts, if we can call them that, are associated with the Lord Jesus, both, both here in 1 Corinthians and in Ephesians 4. We find that the personage working behind those gifts is Christ himself. When we look at the text. The third category of gifts are the energema. Everybody say energema, just because it's a cool word, right? Energema, and see how Paul describes them. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now, energema is derived from the word energia. What do you think our English word is that relates to that? Energy, right? Paul is borrowing from a concept that Aristotle developed in the 4th century B.C., and our young, our young people from the, from the Abbey are actually studying Aristotle a little bit, as I understand. Well, this comes from him. He developed an idea that he called the Energema, and it's this idea that inside it was the, there is this working within each person that motivates every person to behave the way they do. We see a hint of this when we ask the question to some, of somebody, what energizes you? What is that thing that when you're doing it, it's life and energy and passion? It's the thing that you do for free if you, if you, had, if you had the perfect job. If, if you could just do that thing and didn't have to worry about bills and stuff, that's the thing you would do. That's the inner game. That's the wiring that God has put inside you uniquely that is that is specific to you. And it's, and it's not part of the, necessarily the, 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 the spiritual gifts in the manifestation sense. It's part of how you are wired. You know? And putting, those, putting that in the Father's hand and saying, this is what energizes me, Lord. You know? We might think of these gifts as motivational gifts because we're motivated by them. These gifts are part of who we are, how God has wired us, and I believe that these are the gifts that Paul talks about in Romans 12. So we see in Ephesians 4, those gifts that Christ himself is administering. In Romans 12, the gifts that the Father has put in us, in our creation. And in 1 Corinthians 12, through chapters 12, 13, and 14, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit as he moves in the local church and the church in the world. These gifts have been given to us. So let's bring this all together. The charismata the, are the manifestations gifts of the Holy Spirit. The diakonia, the, the service gifts from the Lord Jesus himself. And the energema, the motivational gifts that God the Father has given us. Now why did he give us these gifts? So we can sit in a pew and go to church on Sunday? No. This isn't it. This is where we're rallying together, coming together, encouraging one another, building one another up so we can go back out there and do something for the kingdom. Right? That's what this is about. And these, that's what these gifts are for. It's for a whole bunch of people who don't know Jesus yet. It's for people who are in the church and, and needing of encouragement and strength and growth. That's why we have these gifts. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12... 13 and 14, Paul is primarily dealing with the spiritual gifts because these were severely being abused by the church at Corinth. The issue that the Corinthians had was that they saw all these gifts as coming from different spirits. And they elevated some gifts over the others, and this created divisions in the church. And it brought confusion to their gatherings. 
The Bible, he says in, in 1 Corinthians 14, God is not the author of what? Confusion. And that's exactly what was happening at Corinth because they were abusing the gifts. People were all trying to make sure that they had their turn to use their gift to the point that there was no structure and no orderliness in their gatherings. People were filled with pride, such that they looked down on others who didn't have the same gift of them. This is a mess. Can you imagine what going to a, 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 celebra- a church service or a celebration or a gathering with, with a group of people who were all hung up and that would feel like? Probably wouldn't go the next week, would you? You know? And then Paul throws a ringer at him. He said, you know what? In all this talk about spiritual gifts, the missing ingredients in the Corinthian spiritual lives was love. That's why you're messing this all up, because you don't love each other. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul continues his discussion on spiritual gifts like this. At the end of 12, he says, okay, all these gifts work together. Everyone has them. That's wonderful. Do your part. Fill your role. But let me show you a better way. And he goes on and he says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels but don't have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, these are all spiritual gifts he's addressing here, but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body over to hardship, that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul summarizes his thoughts on spiritual gifts by saying that the gifts are meaningless without love. Who cares about your gifts, your talents and abilities and anointing, whatever you want to call it, if you are a loveless, self-seeking person? Nobody cares. That's not going to build the kingdom. It's only these gifts working through love that makes it work. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, Paul defines love by these character traits and actions. In verse 4, he says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast, and it's not proud. Notice how close these characteristics are to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Right? Those are the, this, this love issue is huge when it comes to a church functioning, as a church, a, a, being healthy. And the, the church at Corinth had completely missed it. In verse 5, he goes on to talk about some of the other actions of love. It does not dishonor others. It doesn't look for a way to put people down. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Remember that thing you did to me back in 1973? (laughs) I am forgotten. And I'm not going to let you forget either. Right? It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Verse 6, he goes on, Love does, does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. How badly the church at Corinth needed to hear this. That poor church was divided. Its gatherings were confusing. Self-seeking individuals were looking for opportunities to become important and be the ones that everybody sought out for the answers. Right? And on the surface, they had the trappings of spirituality, but on the inside, they were a mess. They sent envoys to ask Paul to settle the questions and debates on spiritual gifts, and he changed the conversation. He says, yeah, let's talk about spiritual gifts, but the most important thing is love. Who cares about all your gifts? Do you love each other? Do you love the people around you? Is your life marked by selflessness you know, and a desire to see your brothers and sisters grow in their walk, and a desire to see lost people come to Christ. 
Love was the answer to their divisions and arguments about church leaders. Love was the answer to their abuses in the communion supper. They're suing each other in pagan courts. Right? They're tolerating sexual immorality and incest. Their legalism. If you truly love, you can't be caught up in those messes. If, 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 you're, if you're living in, God, in, in the love of Christ is filling your heart, you can't get caught up into that stuff. The Spirit of God in you won't let it happen. In verses 8 and 10, Paul tells the Corinthians, love never fails. Love never fails. He said, now, if there's, pro there's prophecies, they're going to stop. If there's tongues, they're going to cease. He goes on. He says, you're so obsessed with the gifts. These things are temporary, and they're incomplete. We only have them because we don't have the big picture right now. But when that which is complete comes, these temporary things are going to go away. He goes on to compare chasing spiritual gifts, in the Corinthians' context anyway, with being a child going after playthings. In some ways, this is what the church at Corinth was doing. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. And when it comes down to it, he said, only three things remain forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Love. love. That's, that's the bedrock that, that makes a healthy church. A church not built on its doctrines and its, its spirituality, whatever that is, from congregation to congregation, but love. If we have a foundation of faith and hope and love, the rest of the structure is going to be just fine. All the other stuff will come, will, will settle in exactly as it needs to settle in. So what does all this mean for us in 2022? What do we need to understand about the manifestation gifts, the service gifts, and the motiva motivational gifts in our time? You know, in our church? What do these things look like at First Baptist? Yeah. We're going to explore that question in the coming weeks. For, for today, here's what I want you to take away. Three thoughts that I want, to take, want you to take away from this message. One, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You are empowered by Him. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you right now. That's the truth. You're not missing anything. In fact, I would go so far to say that it is impossible to live a Christian life without being empowered by the Holy Spirit. I think the, I can create a pretty strong biblical case for that. You know, so we have him. You're not going to get any more of the Holy Spirit by jumping up and down or singing real loud or waving your hands. You're not going to get any more. He's in you. He has completed his redemptive work in your heart, in your spirit. And eventually, that will be reflected in our physical bodies as well. So you are empowered by the Holy Spirit now. You have a service gift. You have a role to play in the edification of the whole church. The, and the roles of the service gifts in Ephesians chapter 4 are less about offices in the church and more about people called to serve the church in specific ways. We have two pastors on staff here at First Baptist, Pastor Larry and myself. But we have more pastors in our pews. And we have evangelists and teachers and, dare I say, apostles and prophets. And when we get into the, we look at Ephesians chapter 4, I want to put a spin on that for you that, that maybe you haven't heard before. It's nothing new. It's just a different way to consider what those gifts look like. We'll unpack that more in a couple of weeks. The third thought, first, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Second, you have a service gift. Third, you are a gift. Did you hear me? You are a gift to the body of Christ. Jesus gave us a package with a big red bow on it one day and said, here, I have this gift just for you. And you open it up and there's Dion. <laughs> you know? 
Right? But you are a gift. Every one of us are gifts to each other. God has wired you with desires and, motiva- and motivations. When brought under his lordship, they impact others for Christ. Your unique blend of personality and life experience and motivations and perspective brings something, it brings something unique to the tapestry that is First Baptist. Every one of you. And my prayer is that God unleashes all of us to the work he has created for us to accomplish. Remember going back a few messages before from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul said, we are his handiwork. You know, Joanne James' husband works with wood, makes all kinds of cool things. That's his handiwork. Well, God has worked you as a potter works the clay. You're his handiwork. We are his handiwork created for good works that he has foreordained. And it's not just to warm a seat on Sunday mornings in a pew. It goes much bigger than that. And while we want to avoid the mess that Corinth, Corinth found itself in because of the church's misunderstanding and misuse of spiritual gifts, we don't want to be guilty of the other extreme, that of ignoring what the Bible teaches about gifts. To do so means we miss people's giftedness altogether and relegate the, ele- the edification of the church to just a chosen few. That's the other error. We don't want to fall there either. Right? As Paul said in our text, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. So my challenge to you this week as you consider these things is to say, Lord, first show me where I am already working in my gift. And it's not just church stuff. You know, Freeman and Sandy do amazing things with wood and leather and all kinds of things. That's a gift from God. I can create a scriptural case for that. That's a gift from God. The other, it's, it's, who, it's all those things that who we are. Well, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. We're going we're gonna to close our service here in a sh- shortly. But it's all of those things. It's, it's not just the, the spiritual stuff that we're talking about. It's bringing what we have. Each of us has a few loaves of bread and some fish that we can give to Jesus. You know, some people's fish is a little stinkier than others. (laughs) But he'll take it, and he will use it and multiply it and turn it into something we never thought possible. Amen? And this is irrespective of our age, of our standing in life, of our gender. doesn't matter. We all have gifts that we can serve the Lord with every day of the week and with each other and with the world around us. Amen.